Hi, I'm Amber Dermont, author of the novel The Starboard Sea, and I'd like to welcome you all to Scotty Book Month. I grew up by the ocean on Cape Cod, and so the water was always an important source of inspiration for me. Um, when I was younger, I went to a prep school that was also a boarding school right on the ocean on Cape Cod. And when I was there, it was a very curious place because it was so beautiful, and yet there was this sort of undercurrent of um, overprivilege. And uh, I saw time and time again what happened <clears throat> to my friends um, when they didn't quite know how to handle the responsibility of being on your own and being young and without parents uh, to tell you right from wrong. And so a number of the things that I witnessed in my childhood stayed with me and um, I knew always that I wanted to write about uh, unchecked privilege. When I was a first year student in, in high school, there was a terrible hurricane and um, the hurricane uh, just did unreal damage to the waterfront, my school, and there were all of these yachts. Now, to have a yacht is, you know, if you have a yacht, you've really made it in life. You really have exceeded probably all expectations for yourself. It's such a luxury. Um, but these boats hadn't been moored, they hadn't been taken care of, and so they crashed to shore. Now, someone paid money to have them airlifted. And I remember watching these helicopters fly, fly overhead and winch the yachts and carry them up into the sky. And I remember looking at that and thinking that it was one of the most beautiful and one of the saddest images I'd ever seen in my life. And I knew, even at that very young age, that I wanted to use that image in a story. And so that was one of the first inspirations I had for writing this book. The second was something that um, I sort of stole from John Fowles. If you've read The French Lieutenant's Woman, Fowles often talks about how he was visited by a woman who was standing on a quay. And she was a beautiful woman and she was looking out into the ocean and he didn't know what she was looking toward. He didn't know what she was searching for, but she haunted him. And I saw this similar woman. I saw her out on a, on a groin of rocks, standing out in a break of rocks, and I knew that she was important, and I knew that if I just sort of carried her with me for some time, eventually she began to talk to me as a character, and eventually I'd be, be able to understand her story. And that character became Aiden in the novel. So those were the two inspirations for me. Uh, and both happened when I was very young. And I just held on to them. And one of the things I try to tell my students, the writing process is a very, very long process. Um, stories just don't appear overnight, usually. Usually you hear something, you see an image, a word triggers you, and you have to be patient with your story. So I began working on this novel years and years and years ago, but I would put it aside for a good bit of time. Um, I was working on a collection of short stories and I finished that collection. And when I did, my, um, my agent was very excited, but then he said the thing that all writers are terrified to hear, which is, do you have a novel? And I said, I have 100 pages of a novel. And I'd been working on those 100 pages for a very, very long time. So when the time came to put my books out into the world to s attempt to sell them, um, I sold this novel on a partial, on 100 pages plus a synopsis. And the truth is, is that I'd been working for so many years, but I didn't actually know what happened in the next 200 pages of the book. And it was only through writing that summary, writing that outline, that I really forced myself to commit to a story. And this is another thing that I tell my students, that sometimes you have to demystify the writing process for yourself. You have to know what you're writing toward. What is the ending that I'm writing toward? Once I wrote the synopsis, I had this incredible guide for, for myself as a writer. And 
It took me years to write the first 100 pages, but I wrote the final two thirds of the book very quickly. And I was very lucky because I had a sabbatical leave um, that I was lucky enough to be given by, by Agnes Scott. And I wrote the final two thirds of the book in a very compressed period of time. Um, and during that time, I really didn't talk to anybody. I didn't leave my apartment. Um, I would call my parents on the phone once a day. Uh, and the reason for that is that when you're writing a novel, you have to be in the world of your novel. You're creating an entire world and you have to be in it with your characters. And so if I you know, left too long, if I had too much time away from the stories, um, I had a very hard time getting back into the, the world, the conflicts, the characters. So that's something too to think of when you're writing a book, the intensity um, and the sustained intensity. So uh, for three months, I basically every day lived and breathed this book. The Starboard Sea is set in 1987. And the story takes place at a prep school on the coast of New England uh, with some jaunts into uh, Manhattan and uh, Cambridge and Boston. Um, 1987 is a very literary year. It was a time of great political change. It was a time of um, a tremendous financial eruption. The Black Monday stock market crash was an event that I remember very distinctly from my adolescence. And uh, that crash was peculiar because to this day it's a black swan event, meaning no one understands it. It's inexplicable. Uh, and so I thought it would be fun. My brother is an investment banker and I've talked to him a lot about uh, the crash. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be fun to come up with a reason for why it happened? So that's one of the elements uh, in the book. And one of the big themes of the book is the mutability of, of sexual desire and um, the characters are young enough that they, they have a certain amount of experience but they still don't know their own hearts, what their own heart, des heart desires. Um, and I wanted to write about sailing because of the intimacy. And once I understood that Cal and Jason were sailors, I knew that they would have such a close proximity uh, to each other uh, when sailing, that their bodies would have to, to move as one. And I thought a lot about that, that physical intimacy and how that might carry over into their relationship. I, I thought that it would be fun to imagine a school where all of the kids who'd gotten kicked out from all of the better schools wound up. Uh, that if we had a place, a landscape that was filled with, with young people with very powerful imaginations and with very strong desire to, to push boundaries and to break rules, that there'd be a lot of conflict. And, and really, storytelling is all about conflict. Uh, character plus conflict equals plot. That's the sort of the, the definition, the equation. One of the questions I often get is, why did you write and how did you write from a male point of view? Now, as a writer, I think you have to be able to write from any point of view. But for me, um, growing up and going to a prep school that was largely male, um, in my first year class, there were 60 boys and nine girls. So in many ways, I grew up seeing the world from a male point of view. It's not unfamiliar to me to imagine um, what a man thinks and how he sees the world and his own particular advantages or disadvantages. With Jason, I wanted very much to write about a young man who was in conflict with himself. I wanted to write about somebody who had done something terrible, but who was still a very caring and compassionate and loving person, that he was someone I wanted the audience to be able to empathize with him. And it was very difficult because I knew going into the writing of the book that he had done something. And I didn't want to hide it from the reader. I wanted the reader to know that he was in mourning, that he 
uh, felt not only grief and loss, but guilt. And that m in many ways, it was only going to be through meeting Aiden, through, through meeting another character who had similar pain, similar sense of loss, that he would be able to reconcile his own culpability. And um, so their relationship uh, is not complete without Cal, that this is sort of, this sort of a triangular relationship um, and that in many ways uh, Cal and Aiden are the touchstones of, of Jason's life, that they enable him to, uh, to achieve a kind of peace and hope. And John Irving believes that all novelists need to know the, the absolute last sentence of their books, otherwise they're common liars. Now, I wouldn't take it that far, but I do think it's important to know what the final image is. And I knew that the last word in my book, no matter what, was going to be star. I knew that I wanted to end on that word, that there was a certain charm to it, that the stars are very important, celestial navigation, um, finding your way. I'm gonna read a section from the very end of the novel. In this point of the book, Jason is returned to the sea, the sea where he first met Aiden. He's just graduated from Bellingham and he's saying goodbye. Just one last time, just to say goodbye, I walked down to our beach. As I trudged across the familiar sand, I stripped off my suit, leaving my clothes on the shore and dove into the cold Atlantic. The wind was picking up. I scanned the harbor for yawls, for when I might steal and sail across the equator, past the horse latitudes, down to the southern hemisphere, hoping to find myself under Argo Navis, the ship of stars, the boat that ferried Jason and his Argonauts to their golden fleece. The constellation, once the largest in the sky, had been broken up, separated by astronomers. Where once there had been a single constellation, now three smaller groupings of stars glittered. Carina the keel, Vila the sails, Cupis the stern. I wanted to sail under our shattered constellation. Aiden and Cal, my fellow privateers, the two of them giving off more light, more warmth than I deserved. Cal would teach Aiden how to work the lines her red hair fiery in the moon glow. She would whisper to Cal how sorry I was, convince him to forgive me. It was only because of Aiden that I had begun to forgive myself and only because of Cal that I had learned to care for Aiden, the three of us, part of some larger whole. I wanted to swim until the dark water and navy sky were one. I felt myself rising soaring away from the school, hunting the sky for yachts, believing that it took those three extravagant boats and those sturdy helicopters to chariot Aiden and Cal away from me. The tide was coming in, the waves gaining strength, but I felt buoyant, triumphant even. I ducked my head under water, held my breath, lengthening the keel of my body, Swimming closer to the rocks, I heard the waves and wind creating their own siren song, the soft voices of my lost friends. I flipped over, floating on my back and leaning into the starboard sea, the night descending, stretching above me like a map, promising instruction, direction. I would spend the rest of my life searching for guiding stars. Sailing plays a major role in the novel. Whether you are familiar or unfamiliar with the sailing terms, how does Jason's sailing partnership with Cal help you to understand the closeness of their relationship?
How did the language and nomenclature of sailing and celestial navigation serve as metaphors throughout the book? The novel is set in 1987, and there are important references to the Black Monday stock market crash, Baby Jessica, and the Robert Chambers preppy murder trial. Why do you think I chose to set the novel in the past? Those of you who are familiar with this time period, how well did I capture the late 1980s? Whether you are familiar or unfamiliar with this time period, how might this setting mirror the current cultural and economic landscape? Throughout the novel, there are references to several literary works, O Pioneers, The Awakening, The Scarlet Letter, Moby Dick, The Sun Also Rises, The Motion of Light and Water. Many of these books are often read in high school. Why do you think these novels in particular were referenced? How do these books resonate within the lives of the characters? Aiden, Nadia, and Diana are all anagrams. Why do you think I gave these characters these names? How might these characters be connected through these anagrams? And there is a correct answer to this question. Aiden, Nadia, and Diana are all anagrams for naiads, water goddesses. I wanted these three characters to represent different aspects of water and inspiration for Jason. I'm going to read a section from my novel, The Starboard Sea. This is from the opening, and this brief description um, will put some context into the type of school, uh, Bellingham Academy, the school that Jason has just transferred to, what type of school it's like, uh, and what type of student attends the school. Most of us who found ourselves at Bellingham had been kicked out of better schools for stealing or having sex or smoking weed rich kids who'd gotten caught, been given a second chance only to be caught again, then finally expelled. We weren't bad people, but having failed that initial test of innocence and honor, we no longer felt burdened to be good. In some ways, it was a relief to have fallen, to have messed up only to land softly, cushioned, as my dad reminded me, by a goddamn safety net of your parents' wealth. Bellingham offered us sanctuary, minimal regulations, and a valuable lesson. Breaking rules could lead to more freedom. Because the school catered to thieves, sluts, and dope fiends, it was understood that additional transgressions would be overlooked. If you could pay, you could stay. I comforted myself knowing that I'd lowered all future expectations 
So long as I didn't torch my dormitory or poison my hallmates, I was free to take full advantage of the lax standards and leniency. But all this freedom would indeed cost me something, a stain on my reputation. I'd been Bellinghammed. It was almost as bad as winding up at Choate. Now, the funny thing when I read that is that, um, depending on the audience, some people know what Choate is. And Choate is a, now it's an excellent um, prep school, but at the time this book took place, it was sort of a school for second and third chances as well. And usually when I read this, there's always somebody in the audience who comes up to me afterwards and says, I went to Choate. And so I smile and apologize and then, and then say, well, then that joke was for you. And uh, it's, it's sort of a, a lovely inside moment. So you write a book, and being a writer is a very lonely pursuit. I, I joke that I spend 98% of my time by myself, um, but I'm only half joking. In order to, to be any sort of artist, you really have to, you have to isolate yourself from the rest of the world at times, um, but you're doing that because you want to communicate. And I often think that the beautiful part of being a writer is that you, know, you write something and then it is, in many ways, no longer yours. It goes out into the world. And I like to think that my, my books will have a much more interesting life than I could ever imagine. That they will go out and they will meet people and they will make friends and they will meet people who will maybe be confused by them, um, but maybe reread them. Um, and they, you know, ultimately, as a writer, you're very lucky if your book uh, reaches an audience. And I was very successful in, in sort of imagining that uh, I would finish a book, but it never occurred to me that um, my book, that anyone would read it. And, and, um, and I think that uh, it's, a, it's a sort of beautiful thing um, when your book goes out into the world. It's no longer yours. It's for the world to discover. And you know, quite honestly, the book is a, it's a creature unto itself. And um, I was so fortunate, so lucky, that my, my book did find an audience. Um, it received a, a really sort of lovely attention um, from the New York Times and um, from a number of other publications. And it made the bestsellers list, which is, is, is pretty unheard of for a debut author. Uh, my press, St. Martin's, had a tremendous amount of support uh, that they offered me. And they, they really believed in the book. And they wanted very much uh, to you know, sort of promote and publicize and, and see to it that people found the book, that it reached an audience. And that's just luck. I mean, that's just, you know, everyone who, you know, sort of, uh, you know, for years I, I, I wrote and I published, but for years people would say, you know, my friends, um, I'm very good friends with Natasha Trethaway, who's our, our poet laureate, and she teaches at Emory. And she said to me once, like, you did it right. You knew what you wanted. You knew that you wanted to take your time. And you knew that when you published your book, you wanted it to make its way out into the world and to be heard. And um, I don't like to, you know, I, I don't think that, that writers uh, should be driven by ego. I think you should be driven by your art. But I know that uh, the greatest pleasure of this whole process for me has been hearing from people. Um, I get letters and emails from young people, especially, who, um, you know, really feel alone uh, in terms of their identity, in terms of their sexuality. Uh, they fear rejection from their families. And they, they write to me that this book has, has helped them, that it's um, shown them a type of acceptance, a type of love. And uh, I, I can't tell you how much that, that means. That's, it, we read because we can never have enough friends. We can never know enough people. We can never go out in the world and, and know everyone. Um, and 
yet you as a writer can create all these different worlds and characters and people who become your friends by being characters. And then it's extraordinary when strangers write to you and it's as though you've known them your whole life, that you have this kind of, there's a kind of intimacy with reading. And so it's lovely to have good book sales. It's lovely to get great reviews. All of that's wonderful. It's wonderful to travel and meet people. But the best part for me really is hearing from, you know, a 14-year-old teenage girl in, in Kansas or, you know, a 28-year-old uh, man in LA, people I would not have known or heard from otherwise if not for this book. And, you know, that's, that's the great gift and blessing of, of being an artist that you are in dialogue with the world and in, in a you know in a, in a very intimate and uh, and at times surreal way. Now, when you're writing a character, you need to do several different things to sort of get to know them. You need to be able to write in their voice. And I always knew I wanted this this novel to be a first person uh, novel. I wanted to have access to how Jason saw the world, but I also wanted to have access to his language. I knew that he was going to talk about sailing, and I understood that, that sailing was going to become a metaphor for much of his own life. Um, I didn't want to be so over the top with it that it um, would alienate a reader who doesn't know anything about sailing. So I, I tried to use the terms in such a way that they informed the narrative. When I was in high school, my um, uh, over the summer before I began, I w was given the assignment to read Lord of the Flies and a separate piece. And um, in my first year English class, there were 12 students, and of those 12, 10 were boys and two were girls. And I was one of the girls. And now the funny thing about the Lord of the Flies and a separate piece, there are no fe female characters in those books. And so, there I was reading these two books, all males, um, and they're, they're very different books, but they have similar sort of themes about authority and, you know, young male identity. And um, when I read a separate piece, I read it as a love story. I knew that Phineas and Jean loved each other and that it was that love that really drove them to, to harm each other. And I remember being in class and being very excited to be a good, good English student. And I remember talking about the fact that, you know, this was a, a love story. And my English teacher, who was a young man who, you know, had only been teaching for a couple of years, ultimately wasn't that much older than, than I was at the time, he looked at me stricken and put his hand up and said, well, let's table that. And, you know, the honor code is very important in this book. Let's talk about the honor code. Now, I was recognizing that there were two characters in this, this story who were males who were in love. And, you know, maybe they were gay, maybe they weren't gay. But it was something that deserved to be recognized and discussed. And my teacher at the time didn't want to talk about that, in large part because there were 10 boys in the class who all started to sort of, you know, move around in their seats and get nervous and laugh. And that really stayed with me and haunted me because I thought it was a moment of, of really, you know, it was, it was a misstep in this man's teaching. I'm confident that someone in that classroom, you know, was either struggling with their own identity or, you know, wanting desperately to read about a character that was maybe similar to them, that had similar desires or, or thoughts or feelings. And in that moment, that teacher shut down that discussion. And that really stayed with me. Um, and as a teacher, you know, I try always to be open and caring and thoughtful about all the different voices in my classroom. And I was only 14 at the time, but I remember thinking that I wanted to fix what had just happened. And in many ways, this book was my attempt to address that, that moment in my own adolescence when 
when uh, you know I felt that a story needed to be told and heard, and and it wasn't. So uh, though you know a separate piece is not my ideal perfect prep school book, it is a book that I thought about that in some ways inspired the relationship between these characters. And you know the funny thing is is that John uh, um, Knowles, who wrote that book, uh, he never acknowledged that Phineas and Jean, that it was any sort of a love story. And I think that the author is often the worst person to ask about their own book. They're often the least authoritative. Um, and I think that it's, it's a much less interesting book to think about. Um, so there is a relationship between uh, that novel and mine, but it's not so direct. It's not that I was attempting to rewrite that book. I was really attempting to solve a moment in my own my own uh, my own uh, education that I felt was was a gap was a hole was a missed opportunity.